Hello and welcome to Stories for Storious, my pals. Oh, today we have a good one for you. Today we will be discussing Gita Katari's The Spaces Between the Stars because it was adapted into a short film. The cast and the director will be interviewed tonight so we can see how the cast really got into character and completely went in depth into the amazing work of art Katari created. Welcome back. Here we have the brilliant mind behind the adaptation. We have Sarah Owens here, the director. Now, Miss Owens, what made you want to first adapt this story? I actually first read The Spaces Between the Stars in my 30 English class. My English teacher was just this really great guy, and I fell in love with reading. I knew when I first got into the film industry that this would be the first film I wanted to make. Wow, that's so cool! I'm sure you and the cast must have absolutely worked wonderfully together. You must know a lot about the story with such an amazing English teacher. Yeah, of course. I made sure we all went in and got classes and relearned all the ins and outs of the story. I'm sure the cast would love to teach you some of it. Wow, that's wonderful! I was actually hoping you'd say that. Why don't we dive right in now? Died. It's just the sunfish. They're everywhere. Holy cannoli. That was a beautiful scene to kick off the story in the short film. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. I think I remember it from my from my grade 12 imprints textbook, page 100, right? Oh my goodness. That was the exposition, right? Yeah, and it was also the initial incident of the sunfish dying. Wow, two in one! I can't believe that! Was there anything else going on there? There actually was, but I think the main star is Christopher and I would be better at explaining it. Okay. This scene really kicks off the characterization of both the protagonist Maya and her husband Evan. We see that Evan is quite the all-American guy, as portrayed on page 101. And that quote is, he was resourceful and knew how to do things beyond the realm of her own experience. We also start to learn about Maya here. She's quite shaken by the death of the fish, and we start to get the feel that something isn't quite right with her. This is shown on page 101 in the line, her guilt pressed against her temples, tightening like a vice around her head. This also introduces the main conflict in the story as person versus self. Maya's self-doubt becomes the main antagonist of the story. Wow, that's amazing. So you could really say Evan and Maya are foils of each other, right? Oh, that's perfect. Oh, and there are no I, me, or my pronouns, which means that it's a third person limited omniscient, right? Right? Yeah! Oh, good. <laughs> the fish also becomes a major motif in the story, representing Maya herself, but that will become more evident as the story goes on. The fishing trip had left her empty and dry inside. The smell of blood lingered on her fingers. She felt dirty, stained by the death of the sunfish. Indian food? You never cook that. It's because I can't. Whoa, don't forget, my folks are coming next week, and they want an answer about the trip. She was shaken by the reminder of the trip. You see, Maya did not feel as though she fit in with Evan's family. She thought of herself as too different. Wrong. Sorry. Broccoli was soggy. Are you okay? Fine. Maya was not fine. But Evan was a psychologist, she thought. Let him figure it out. That was heavy. Yeah, this scene was really hard to get right. We wanted to capture every element perfectly to reflect Katari's theme in her writing. I think you definitely managed to do that. I can't believe that the story is this intense on page two. Can you imagine that? Do you think you could tell us a little bit more in detail what the scene was really like to film? For sure. Well, the scene is right after the fishing trip. We can see how affected Maya is by the death of the sunfish. Mm -hmm. And we can also see that there's something a little off with her. Yeah, she's quite upset. 
and Evan really has developed his character in this scene. You can tell he really cares about her, but he kind of avoid the fights, which means he's probably like afraid of confrontation, right? Yes, that's correct. Very good observational skills. That's an example of what we'd like to call indirect characterization. And it's how we can tell the audience how characters are without having to directly tell them. The food is actually a major symbol in the story. We can see already that Maya is a very insecure woman. Her inability to cook Indian food represents her lack of accepting of her own culture. She is an Indian woman, but she was raised American, and she feels relation to neither. We can see this symbol throughout the story. That's amazing. And I also noticed some verbal irony in there, right? When Maya, right at the end, she was like, I'm fine. And then the narrator said that she wasn't fine. Maya's parents died in a plane crash when she was young. So she grew up alone with her aunt Shyama. They were a family, blood in a world of strangers. Like fish, they swam in the same school. A school of two, but a school nonetheless. Dodging predators, careful of false bait. But Maya had finally bitten. Life with Evan was too tempting, an easy guarantee that she would not end up like Shyama. Our final star on the show tonight is Miss Shay, who played Maya's aunt. Now, Shyama must have been, you know, very important to Maya. She is uh, introduced on page 103 and continues to be characterized until page 106, right? Yes, um, Shyama was always a mother figure to Maya and gave up everything just to give her the life she wanted as a daughter. Heroin addict. When they need a fix, they itch so bad they want to jump out of their skin. The death of the fish had triggered something in Maya. And as she remembered the man on the train, she realized that she felt the same way. She wanted to be out of her skin, out of her life and into another. One that fit her, not one that she had to fit. I'm finally starting to understand the intensity on page 106. I'm starting to understand the fish motif now as well. It's a foreshadow, isn't it? Maya is a fish out of water. She's trying to fit in a world where she doesn't even belong. When her sunfish died, it was her world telling her to make a change before she lost herself in the world of chaos around her. So have you thought about the ski trip? I don't want to go. Why not? When I was younger, all I ever wanted was to go on the school ski trips. Every year they had one and all the cool people went. Those who couldn't afford it did cross country on their own. Shyama wouldn't even let me do that. When I said she didn't trust me to take care of myself, she said it was too cold. Too cold for me. But really it was too cold for her. So here's your chance. I don't care anymore. I can't do it. You won't even try? Why is it so important to you that I ski? Because you're part of the family. Your brother-in-law is part of the family, but I don't see your sister forcing him to go on this trip. Jesus, Maya! You're the one that wanted to go fishing, you're the one that wanted to ski, and now you're blaming me. There was the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, and Orion the Archer. The whole sky filled their ceiling. She thought of scattering the stars where she pleased, but Evan put them up, arranging each and every one as they were supposed to be, each star in its place. But where was hers? She had thought with Evan she could find it. That was a crazy scene. There was really a high point of tension there. Also, you could really see that Maya and Evan were at their lowest points. Oh my gosh, what page was that again? 107? Of course. We refer to their fight as the climax. 
The fight with Evan reveals to Maya that she's not the all-American stereotypical woman she thought she could be, but she doesn't entirely encompass her Indian roots either. Maya is utterly and entirely lost. She doesn't know who she's supposed to be. Did you notice the paintings at the end of the scene? We use those to represent the symbol of the stars in the story. Maya sees the stars as her Indian heritage and the American she wants to be, but because she can't accept her past and she's not the American that she needs, she realizes that she was incomplete. Maya was in the dark and she didn't have a single star to light her way. Absolutely riveting. As we have seen, Maya deals with some deep internal struggles. How did you immerse yourself in the character for Maya when she has such a terrible turmoil? Maya is such a dynamic and well-rounded character. She's quite distraught, and while that does make her plausible, I had to dig deep to find out what really motivated her. The thing is, Maya is not alone in her struggle. Immigrants, women, children, so many people often feel lost in life, unable to find balance. Because of that, I was really able to get in and figure out what drove Maya. Thank you, Naya. So would you say that people can often turn into their own antagonists? I mean, Maya, Maya's self-doubt was incredible. Oh, of course. So what about Evan? Christopher, tell me, how did you manage to encapsulate Katari's character so well? So it was actually really easy for me to get into his character. He was displayed as a very static, all-American dude, just a one-sided individual. But as the story go on, we begin to see that he is more of a round character. He's extremely devoted to his wife, and I think that's what makes the conflict so beautiful. So how did Maya react to this strife between her and Evan? Well, it's almost like we made an entire scene devoted to that. Evan called. He was wondering if you'd be home for dinner tonight. I left him a note. I killed a fish. Did you eat it? No, I tried to save its life. That sounds like a contradiction. It was an accident. You know, you don't have to come over every time you want masala chai. I know. Maya had the recipe carefully pasted into a notebook with a number of other recipes. Now she understood Shyama had not been preparing her for anyone but herself. Go. Oh, beans! That dialogue was from page eight, right? Oh, right near the end. This is where Maya really has a change of heart and distinguishes her turning point in the story, right? This is where she changes from a static to a dynamic character. Yeah. Maya realizes that she's neither Hindu or American. She doesn't have to be one or the other. And she's her own individual. She has her own unique and perfect culture just for herself. And in the denouement, she realizes that she's got to create her own path. Wow, there seems to be a theme in the story of conflicted people finding solace in, well, really, the individuality of everyone. Shyama used to have this shrine in the corner of our kitchen. Incense, candles, and this old calendar painting of Ganesh. But whenever I had friends over, I would always try to keep them from going in there. Why? So I wouldn't have to hear them laugh and have to explain why my aunt was worshipping a god with an elephant head. The god of all beginnings and remover of obstacles. Shyama told you that? When we got married. As we waited for the stars to come out, I realized that from here I could finally accept myself. <laughs>